give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken, and great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. You give life. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord.
Have a seat. Good morning, family. How are you this morning? Good, good. Are you letting this warm weather get to you? It's okay to do that. I try not to let the miserable cold and gray bitterness of winter affect my disposition, but I completely let this warm, beautiful, unexpectedly delightful weather affect my disposition, hence my pleasant disposition this morning. I hope yours is too. There's, uh, and it, it, this pairs very well with the, our resurrection uh, series, Beholding the Risen Christ, because spring is resurrection, like all that is dead, there's new life coming. And, and uh, yeah, there's spring happening inside this building as God brings new life to us this morning. So I can't wait to get into more worship and Paul's teach. But before I do that, three announcements for you. The first one is pertaining to Common Cupboard. Common Cupboard is the uh, food bank here at the meeting place. And every two weeks, we have the privilege of serving approximately 160 um, homes. Uh, families who uh, this serves. But for the next two weeks specifically, we're asking that um, you could bring in some tinned meat. So you're welcome to bring food at any time and contribute towards Common Cupboard, but we're specifically rallying for tinned meat, that good protein. I don't know if that's sardines. Yeah, that's sardines, but I'm thinking like tinned tuna I love. There's ham, there's spam, there's salmon. You can uh, choose your tinned meat of choice, but if it's on your mind when you're in the grocery store, throw a couple extra in your cart if you could buy Bless our community that way. The next announcement is pertaining to child dedication. Child dedication is something we really value here at The Meeting Place. It's an opportunity for parents just to share their commitment to raise their children in the way of Christ and um, foster their relationship with Him and champion their faith in Him. Uh, the next child dedication is happening on Mother's Day, which is May 12th. And if this is something you would like to do, you have the next two weeks uh, to register for that. So April 28th is the cutoff for that. You can register online. It's open now or um, at the back of the welcome desk. And now please watch this short video. Hi, my name is Steve Bell. I'm a Christian singer-songwriter from Winnipeg, Canada. I've spent the last 30 years touring the globe, singing my songs and telling my stories wherever they let me. I've enjoyed the work very much. And as the years have gone on, I've really come to understand my work in very specific terms. And that is of refreshing Christian faith and spiritual tradition for the weary and the wary, which is most of us, I think. And so I've developed a short day and a half retreat for people that want to come and talk about what I think are some essential things to the Christian faith and practice. The gift to call on the Trinity. The saving I teach on the Trinity, the I fact that the Christian tradition understands God very uniquely as a mutuality, as a communion of self-donating mutual love. And that's the very, very center of truth and truth-telling. I also talk about worship. If that is true, and if we become like that, that we worship, what does that mean for worship? And what I don't, I don't teach about worship in terms of how to do it or how your church should do it, more just what's the process or what's the, how does this work with and on us. I teach also about the church calendar year, the spirituality of the church calendar year, that the church every year tells her story year after year after year, much like a grandparent or a parent tells a child the same story over and over because they want to hear it, and that our narrative is an important narrative to keep retelling. And then the last thing is just on the resource of the Psalms and ancient prayers and the lives of the saints, those things that, that inspire us to nobility and faith and prayer. May the favor of the Lord rest upon us and our land. I tend to teach with my guitar in my hand, so there's lots of stories and songs that go along with it. So it's a really great day. I love that this retreat will be happening here. Um, that's, yeah, it's going to be a privilege to host a, uh, this event. Steve Bell, his music is a balm to my soul. There's been times in life where I'm like, I've got to listen to Steve Bell because there is a real peace uh, that is ushered in through his music. And uh, I really appreciate the depth with which he studies the Lord, pursues the Lord, and now shares uh, about him. So I would strongly encourage uh, that you attend this retreat if you just want to Spend a day breathing, two days breathing. You can register online at themeetingplace.mb.ca 
or go easy on yourself and just register at the info desk at the back. Because we attend the meeting place, we actually get a special rate, and there's a code for that. It's, it's at the back, SB Meeting Place, all capitals for S, B, M, and P. <laughs> I'm done now. <laughs> Let's worship. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> singing together. That's what my father does No failure won't define me Cause that's what my father does This week I've been thinking a lot about the scripture that Paul's going to teach from in, a, in, one, in one more psalm. Um, and uh, 
you know, I think y'all are going to hear it, but it's the story of Thomas and, and, and he has this moment of doubt and it's not just like a moment. Paul pointed out to the, to us today that like he says, he makes the statement. He's like, unless I touch the holes in his hands and the hole in his side, I won't believe that Jesus has been resurrected. And then it says in the Bible, a week later, uh, Jesus came to him. And, and I was thinking, it, 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 as I was picking songs this week, I was thinking of like, what, what's something that really speaks to this experience of, of doubting and of the pain of, of not really knowing? And this song, it, it says, in the crushing and the pressing, you are making new wine. Like it talks about like the violence almost of, of God's hand in our lives sometimes. Like it's hard, it's hard to be a Christian sometimes, you know, it, it, it has a cost to it, it has a, a pain to it. Um, and and this, is, this is like, I think the times when it's hardest to trust God are the times when we're going through that. Um, but it also is a necessary part of, of changing to be more like him, to be more like Jesus. So that's what this song's about. And we're gonna, well, Denise is gonna sing it for you. In the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil, I now surrender. You are breaking new ground. So I yield to you and to your careful hand. When I trust you, I don't need to understand So make me a vessel Make me an offering Make me whatever you want me to be I came here with nothing But all you have given me Jesus, bring new wine out of me. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine In the soil I now surrender You are breaking new ground You are breaking new ground So make me a vessel Make me whatever you want me to be I came here with nothing But all you have given me Jesus, bring new wine out of me Jesus, bring new wine out of me
vessel. Make me an offering, make me whatever you want me to be. God, I came here with nothing, but all you have given me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Wine out of me. Amen. Uh. Yeah, if you're in middle school, you can head upstairs. If you don't sit down yet, don't sit down yet. We're gonna shake each other's hands. We're gonna we, we've been calling we've been doing what's called passing the peace. So, uh, greet the people around you. Say the peace of Christ be with you. A reading from the book of John, chapter 20, verses 24 through 31. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, His disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. My name is Paul Walker. I serve as the teaching pastor for now. (laughs) Soon I will be unemployed. Yes, the elephant in the room is that last week I announced that I would be leaving. Uh, I announced my resignation. But I'm not gone yet. I'm here teaching for a few more times before my last Sunday on May 5th. And I realized that can be a bit awkward for some folks. Makes me think of the time. When I was 15 years old, and I was working at a fast food job at Wendy's, and I found a better job, which wasn't hard to do, and I put in my two weeks to my manager, and I gave her, like, my, you know, paper. I was like, here's my two weeks, and my manager was so angry. She didn't even say a word to me, and then so I go, I work my shift, you know, put the fries in and all that, uh, do the drive through, all that, uh, and then at the end of the shift, my manager came up to me, and she said... I've taken you off the schedule for the next two weeks. We will mail you your last check. In other words, she said, you can't quit. You're fired. (laughs) Maybe in your heart, you've already fired me. (laughs) I get it. Not everyone likes goodbyes. Which is why our main stage team came out with some possible solutions. We have a crack creative team, and we put our heads together, and here's some possible solutions we came up with to take away today's awkwardness. Idea number one, I could preach with a paper bag over my head. That'll teach me for going. Feel the shame, Paul. Love that. 
We tested this out this week. I found it really hard to read my notes, and at one point I fell off the stage. So we're like, maybe not that idea. <laughs> idea number two, we could get a puppet. <laughs> And who doesn't like a puppet? I mean, back in the 90s, half of church ministry happened through church puppets, right? Most of you memorized John 3.16 through a puppet, so possible solution. The last idea we thought of is I could wear a wig and assume an alter ego, so introducing (laughs) Saul Santor, teaching a pastor from Mexico. He loves it when people get baptized. You may think he doesn't know a buttload about the gospel, but he do. (laughs) Right? It'd be like, I'm not even here. Maybe you'll see this guy in the future if they have trouble, you know, fill in. (laughs) Speaking days. Now, those are some of our ideas to make it less awkward, but real talk right now, we know we can trust this amazing community of the meeting place. And greater than that, we need to understand that, like, preaching, teaching is not about me, and it's not about any other person on this stage. It's, who's it about? It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. It's about the Holy Spirit who is the teacher. It's about God the Father who alone gets the glory. And because that's true, I'm just looking so forward to opening up these scriptures with you in these next few weeks. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, We may hear with joy what you say to us today. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. John 20, verse 24. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. So our scripture passage today focuses in on Thomas, the disciple of Jesus. And tellingly, he was absent when Jesus walked into the locked room of fear on Resurrection Sunday. Thomas did not get to hear Jesus say, peace be with you. Thomas did not get to see the wounds of the risen Christ. And all Thomas hears are the reports of the other disciples saying, we have seen the Lord. So this begs the question, where was Thomas? Why wasn't he in the room? Well, tellingly, I think this tells us a lot about him. He was outside the locked room. He was not afraid. Think about that. Every other disciple, they're shaking in their boots for fear of the Jewish leaders. And Thomas is just walking around Jerusalem, unafraid, without fear. You see, Thomas in the Gospels, as if you were to zoom in on him, you would discover that he's a person of conviction. He's not so easily swayed. He's honest. He's courageous. He's willing to say what he thinks and why he thinks it. And this is why, despite the testimony of all the other disciples, he seems reluctant to believe the news that Christ is risen from the dead. Thomas doubts the witness of his fellow disciples. And can you blame him? Like ancient people knew as well as we do that dead people stay dead. And now Thomas is hearing reports of the opposite. How is he to make sense of this? How are we to make sense of this? Now, our text today is from the Gospel of John. And John's Gospel is actually it's one of my favorite because it's the deepest, richest Gospel we have in the New Testament. It's full of mystery, meaning, and irony. John wants his readers to just slow down and meditate on what he's giving them. I was once told that when you read the Gospel of John, you should imagine a series of Rembrandt paintings that you just need to meditate on, scenes which you stare at and get deeper and deeper meaning. The reader of John should look deeper into the scenes that John gives us. And today, one of the curious things in our passage that John gives us is this, verse 24. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus. Notice that John includes both the Aramaic and Greek spellings of Thomas' name. John wants both his Jewish and Greek audience to pay attention to something about Thomas. 
To not miss his ironic and subtle point, Thomas means twin. And Thomas has a twin. Who is this twin? Well, we don't know. The twin never shows up again. This reference of the uh, twin never shows up again in the New Testament. The twin get, is never mentioned once in church history. And so it really, like, as you're like, okay, why is he giving us this detail? Why is John wasting ink to tell us about Thomas's twin? It makes no sense unless he's trying to prove a point. And he is. Thomas has a twin. And it's you and it's me. It's everyone who's heard the news of the risen Christ and wondered how could this be? This is especially true of us in our particular place in history. In our secular age, we've all encountered the same robot blocks to belief as Thomas. Doubt is a feature of our modern existence as people living in the post-enlightenment age. Doubting in our modern day is about as common as people dying from the plague in the Middle Ages. It happens a lot. And it's not just Christians either. We're all racked with doubt. The atheist doubts, the agnostic doubts, the Buddhist doubts, the Muslim doubts, the fan of the Winnipeg Jets doubts. <laughs> Will they make it? Can we trust them? We're just a doubting people. Doubt is the feature of the modern age. Some of the stats from Barner Research that help us see this picture are this, that 67% of people who self-identify as Christian have struggled with doubt. 26% say they still experience doubt as a consistent experience. 40% say they have experienced it in the past, but have worked through it. And only about one-third claim to have never experienced doubt at all. What are we to make of this? What do we make of all this data on doubt? What, is, what are the numbers telling us? Well, I love how Canadian philosopher James K.A. Smith sums up the pervasiveness of doubt in our modern age. He writes, Even as faith endures in our secular age, believing doesn't come easy. Faith is fraught. Confession is haunted by an inescapable sense of its contestability. We don't believe instead of doubting. We believe while doubting. We're all Thomas now. We're all Thomas now. So what do we do about that? What does it mean to be the church in an age of doubt? Well, I want to suggest to you that we actually need to think, teach, process, and experience doubt in healthier ways. I think there are a lot of reactive, unhealthy, and even unbiblical responses to doubt in our modern-day church. Some have said doubt is the opposite of faith, or that we cannot doubt within the framework of faithfulness. I think we've often distorted faith to mean psychological certainty. And so I think we need to doubt how we think about our doubts. And so let me say this. If we're going to think about doubt in a healthier way, the first thing I want to say is doubt does not disqualify your faith. Doubt does not disqualify your faith or at least it doesn't need to. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Passing through periods of doubt is a necessary part of spiritual growth, and it really is nothing to be embarrassed by. As we turn to the scriptures, we actually see that doubt is a very common experience for the disciples. In every account of the resurrection in the Gospels, we discover some experience of doubt. So in Luke's gospel, the women are rushing to tell Peter and the disciples the news of the risen Lord. And this is their first reaction. They say, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Not exactly the most faithful reaction. Now, does Jesus give up on Peter and the others because they did not believe the women instantly? Are they disqualified because they had doubts about the initial news of the empty tomb? No. Jesus is still faithful to him. Here's another example from the Gospel of Matthew. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some, what did they do? Doubted. 
I mean, this happens right before Jesus gives them the Great Commission. This happens right before they're about to be sent out to the ends of the earth. And notice that, like, Jesus didn't throw up his hands and say, you no good doubters. I'm going to have to find someone else. No, Jesus still sends the 11 out. The one with all authority invests doubting disciples with authority. So doubting does not disqualify your faith. If it does, then like Jesus had the wrong crowd with him because they were doubting all the time. Faith and doubt can coexist and they always have. When we read the scriptures, we discover that the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob always made room for wrestling with God. It made room for questions, for mystery, and even doubt. The Bible is full of stories of those who doubted yet remained faithful. And really the biblical understanding of faith is a willingness to be honest with ourselves and with God about whatever questions, doubts, and complaints we have. Read the Psalms. I love how A.J. Swoboda puts it in his book on doubt. He says, to struggle with one's faith is often the surest sign we actually have one. Friends, doubt does not disqualify your faith. You don't have to think you're on the outside because you have doubts. It's actually a sign that you probably take your faith very seriously. So another healthier way of thinking about doubt, I think, is this. Doubt does not mean you're faithless either. Just because you have doubts does not mean you're in crisis. It doesn't mean there's zero faith in your life. Faith is not an on and off switch. It's more like a spectrum of deepening trust. We all have faith in something. Mick, you have faith that that chair you're sitting on will hold your weight. You just you put, you sat down right into it. You're like, I trust this chair. You have faith that people follow the rules of traffic, or else you probably would get in your car and come here today. We all have faith in something, and we have some measure of faith. Thomas has his doubts, but he also has faith. He says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, I will not believe. Notice that Thomas has faith here. He does. He has faith in his sight. He has faith in his touch. He's a materialistic evidentialist, if you're curious. But he also has faith in the earlier testimony of the disciples. He has faith in how Jesus died. Remember, in the Gospels, Thomas was not present for the crucifixion of Jesus. When Jesus was arrested in the garden, Thomas ran. Were you there when they crucified my Lord Thomas? Nope. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled, Matthew 26. The Gospels tell us that the only people at the cross of Jesus were John, the beloved disciple, and the women. They were alone were the ones that saw the nails in his hands and feet. They were the ones that saw the spear in his side. Thomas was not there. So all his like, hey, I'm not going to believe until I touch the the wounds in his hands and and the spear in his side. He got all that information secondhand. And yet, he was willing to trust it. Probably because he, like most people of his day, had witnessed many crucifixions. Thomas could trust in what he's experienced before. But it would take greater faith to trust in what he's never experienced before. Resurrection. He's not faithless. He has doubts and he has faith, a faith that is growing. And this leads me to the final thing I want to say about a healthier view of doubt. Sometimes doubt is a doorway to deeper faith. Sometimes doubt is a doorway to deeper faith. Like steel forged and strengthened by fire, Faith is refined by engaging our doubts and questions and not ignoring them. There's a healthy side of doubt that actually brings us along on the journey of faith. Because sometimes a deeper faith involves the hard work of asking tough questions. And this is why I love that Thomas is willing to name his questions and doubts. And more than that, he's willing to name the conditions by which he would believe. 
So he says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, what I find so curious is that the next verse is not, then Jesus appeared. That's not the next verse. The next thing John says after Thomas confesses his doubt, the very next verse is this. A week later, a week later, Thomas sits in his doubts for a whole week. Like, I can't imagine some of the confusion he felt, some of the languishing he felt in his questions. And really, Jesus could have prevented all of that. Jesus could have met Thomas the exact moment he confessed his doubts. But he doesn't. He doesn't. And I think this is because Jesus is not troubled that Thomas will journey through doubt. And he's not troubled when you journey through doubt. Why is Jesus not troubled? Why is he not like... It's crisis mode, got to run in. Because sometimes doubt is a doorway to deeper faith. Remember, like steel forged and strengthened by fire, faith can be refined by engaging our doubts and not ignoring them. And it's only really in our modern age that we think that doubt should be ignored and suppressed. But historically, the church has always taught that the doubt of Thomas was a good thing. It was a good thing. This is what Gregory the Great, this is one of the early church voices, he says, the unbelief of Thomas is more profitable to our faith than the belief of the other disciples. For the touch by which he is brought to believe confirms our minds in belief beyond all question. Okay, I want to wrap up our time today by just speaking to those of us today that may be journeying through a season of doubt. So what to do with your doubts? If you find yourself in that place, I have a couple of things to say. The first is be honest. Be honest about your doubts. Don't deny them. Don't ignore them. Like Thomas, have the courage to honestly name them. There is nothing to be ashamed of. I think that true spiritual growth only happens in our life when we're honest with ourselves and with others. We're not going to get spiritually grow if we're lying to ourselves. We need to be honest. The next thing is be kind. Be kind to yourself. It can be very disorienting to walk through a season of doubt. And I I would encourage you, don't add to the pain of that season by beating yourself up. Don't chastise yourself for doubting. Be kind to yourself. And church, we need to be kind to those around us that are walking through doubt. Jude 22 says, this is one of the brothers of Jesus, be merciful to those who doubt. Mercy is to be our posture as a church. So like, don't don't freak out when someone tells you they're deconstructing. Don't get super upset when people struggle with hard questions. Be merciful. Be full of mercy. Be outrageously compassionate to those that struggle with doubt. Because that might be you in another season of your life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Third thing to do, what to do with your doubts. Be with others. Be with others. So often when we experience the pain of doubt, we can hide ourselves away. We can get quiet, we can get disconnected, we can feel like we have to go somewhere else and work this through. And that kind of loneliness tends to only amplify our agony. See, what we actually really need in those moments, those seasons of doubts, is a community to carry us, just like Thomas did. So notice what Thomas does. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Thomas is doubting, and he is with the other disciples. Thomas is doubting, and the other disciples are with him 
friends, don't go through a season of doubt alone. We were never meant to walk alone. We were never meant to carry our burdens alone. Doubt is no reason to stay out of church because all of us, just like the disciples in Matthew 28, all of us are worshiping doubters. We're all on a journey of deepening trust. None of us has fully arrived, so come, come to the community of worshiping doubters. You see, Christian faith is the task of a Christian community called the church. Our faith in Jesus is not an individualistic faith. We are saved into a community, and it's in the community that we need to grow. As the Desert Fathers used to say, one Christian is no Christian. So be with others. Okay, the last thing of what to do with your doubts, bring them to Jesus. Bring them to Jesus. Bring them to Jesus. See, Jesus is not troubled by Thomas's doubts, and he's not troubled by your doubts. So you can, in fact, bring them to him. In fact, if we're following the story of Thomas, Jesus wants to meet you more than halfway in your doubts and your questions. So verse 26, a week later, his disciples are in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So Jesus, he enters the locked room again, just like he did a week ago. And what does he do? He says, put your finger here. See my hands. Thomas is able to see the wounds of Jesus. He discovers that Jesus is not upset. He goes right to him and says, Thomas, come and see. And then he proclaims, my Lord and my God. Now notice what Jesus does not do when he shows up in the room. He does not say, well, it's really, it's too bad, Thomas, I had to convince you. I'm going to save my blessing for those that don't have any doubts. That's not the picture we get here. What we get is Jesus willing to come to Thomas and prove his willingness to meet us in questions. There's no chastisement here, only kindness. And like Thomas, we too are invited to bring our doubts to Jesus. Like Thomas, we too can touch the wounds of Christ. The risen Christ is known to us by his wounds, and by his wounds we are healed. And so by word and sacrament and mystery, by the sending of the Holy Spirit, we continue to encounter the risen Christ. As we gather together in our place and yours, Jesus wants to be known to you. You see, Jesus is not somewhere out there. He did not leave us as orphans. He sent us the promised Holy Spirit. And wherever two or three are gathered in his name, Jesus has promised to be present. And so my encouragement to you is keep coming before Jesus. If you seek him, he will be found. And he's actually seeking you right now. Keep pressing in. Keep bringing your questions, your doubts before the risen Lord. And as you come before Jesus in prayer, in worship, in the secret place, as you open the eyes of your heart, you will encounter him. He will be made known to you. You will touch the wounds of Christ. Amen and amen. Would you please stand? Christine, I I wonder, could you put up that slide I wasn't going to use? I'm going to use it now. (laughs) So Carl Rahner said this. He said, the devout Christian of the future will either be a mystic who who has experienced something or he will cease to be anything at all. I just want to encourage you now as we go into a time of worship, 
that you reach out, that Jesus is here. The presence of God is here. Reach out and you will experience him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's worship. in my heart and break me apart I need you to open my eyes and see that you're shaping my life all I am I serve
When I first came to the meeting place, I was a young adult, and uh, we weren't as organized at that time as we are now, but the young adults in that group really craved community, and we found each other, and we kind of formed our own small groups or created our own worship experiences. And um, that was so healthy and helpful as a young adult growing in my faith. And if you're a young adult here this morning between the age of 18 and 25, maybe what Paul um, shared this morning has stirred something and you're like, wow, I'd love to have a context where I could land with other young adults to discuss the things that I'm questioning or wrestling with in my faith. Doubting can be really isolating, but it can also be something that can connect you to others as you have on those honest conversations. And at the meeting place on, on Wednesday gatherings, uh, the young adults have been getting together. They start with a potluck to break the ice and just have really candid, uh, good faith-based uh, experiences together. When you give to the meeting place, you support ministries like the young adult ministry. You make it possible for young adults to have a place to land and grow in their faith in that way. Um, and in so many other ways as well. So if you feel uh, prompted to give towards the work of the Lord here at the meeting place, um, you can do that online or any of these giving ways listed above. There's envelopes in the back of your chairs which you can put into any of the labeled giving boxes around the church or at the back there's debit credit. It's cool to participate in what God is doing all around us in that way. Thank you for your ongoing generosity. I would like to invite Pastor Paul at this time to come out and uh, have some Q&R with us. Pastor Paul, thank you for your teach. I, I'm so glad we're talking about this. And um, yeah, it was a really, really comforting and good message. And um, one, yeah, one person said something cute that I'll share. He was wondering if you were leaving TMP to go into marketing a line of pastoral puppets. Mm. Are you going to do that? Pastoral puppet, may just get like you a know, little... You know, we're holding the future very open, so thank you. I'll you add did that say to that. The, there could be the something there. there I think pastors wish sometimes they were just behind a puppet. And then like when people get upset, you'd be like, hey, well, blame the puppet, right? <laughs> That's right. It's like, did you just say that? Yeah. I can't believe you just said that. Yeah. No. Anyways. Um, Pastor Paul... What should we do in a season of doubting? Should we sit in our doubt or should we seek to solve our doubt? What point do you Yeah, think? like, so, so the word that I, I find at tension there is solve. Because hmm. I think sometimes what we think we need to do as modern people, post-enlightenment people, is we think we need to find, like, certainty. And I actually think that certainty is the opposite of faith. If you're certain, you don't need trust. You don't need faith. You don't need anything like that. I think you should, you should lean in and like ask all the hard questions. But like, if there's this sense of like solving, like as if your faith and your deepest relationships could be reduced to a mathematical equation. Mm -hmm. Like, don't don't have like a kind of rationalistic. Um, completely rationalistic approach, but like absolutely like dive in, read the books that you need to, talk to the people you need to, go to prayer in the places and, the, and with the questions that you need to. So yes, lean in, but like don't, don't think that, that you're going to find certainty. That's just my only caution in that. Because I think often we're, we're very left brain people in the Western world. And sometimes we need to realize is that not all knowledge happens in a scientific beaker. Mm -hmm. Like, I can explain to you what happens physiologically when, like, I have the feelings of love for my wife. It's like dopamine releases in my brain. But it's way more than that. Mm -hmm. Like, the heart has reasons for which reason knows not. And I think we have to embrace many different ways of knowing. And so, yeah, that, I'll leave it at that. Hopefully that was enough to respond. I think one of the greatest mysteries of, of my faith, of the Christian faith, is how important faith is. I'm like, Lord, what a mystery that faith has to be a component of whatever it is you call us to, whatever you, you ask us. Uh, it seems anything God's ever called me to, it's required a component of faith and a strengthening of faith. And I wonder how that's going to play out in the future that he's asking us to flex our faith muscle yeah. time and time again because he could come with certainty and stand right here and then we wouldn't need faith, but people still doubted. As you mentioned, even the disciples um, had doubts, 
but they had been with Jesus day in and day out, so I find that comforting. It's okay for me to doubt who have never seen Christ face to face if people still struggle with doubt when they were firsthand witnesses of amazing things. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, yeah. Anyways, my question is, I know sometimes even when I'm preparing to speak and I'm digging in deep to the Bible, I come across things that I haven't come across before. I'm like, what? What? And I wrestle. I do a mm. lot of my wrestling in my faith while I'm uh, preparing to teach. And I was like, who do I talk to about this? Well, I could talk to you, but I'm asking you as a pastor, who do you talk to when you're wrestling yeah. with doubts? And if you feel comfortable sharing with us a time in your faith journey where you really wrestled with doubt, is it something you grew out of and found resolve, or is there stuff that just keeps recurring? If you would trust us with that, I, I would be fascinated. Okay. Um, so, so to the first question, who do I reach out to? Well, I've got mentors in my life. I've got, I've got friends that I can have ongoing conversations with where I could just say, like, hey, I'm struggling with this. I also have dead people. And in the form of books, I get to do some research and like David. So there's all of that too. Like there's a community that I think every good leader needs to surround themselves with. As far as like my own experience of a season of doubt, one I'll share very quickly is it really came from sort of like I knew in my head this wasn't a right belief, but in my body I was like, oh, but I want to believe this. And it was actually during that season of my life where we were in England, Kayla was seven months pregnant, and then we lost our job. Hmm. And I went through this sort of season of like, Jesus, I followed you all the way over here. And it feels like you're letting me down. Mm -hmm. And I sort of, at, behind that struggle was really this, this belief that, like, in this world, I won't have trouble. And that I would preach about from the stage. I'd be like, yeah, like, you're, like life is hard and Jesus is with you. But it's like I wasn't believing that deep in my heart. And so there I was through pain and suffering and I think I was contending with, even though I knew in my head, like, following Jesus is not like some prosperity thing. I think in my experience, I was like, but this is still hard. And I think I, I had to wrestle with, like, do I really trust him in these hard places? Do I really trust um, that he'll be faithful in this? Mm -hmm. and, and I would say it's in those transitionary times for Kaylee and I that we have had the deepest growth in our life. It's where we have discovered that God has been so faithful to us. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's what I'll say to that. Thank you. Um, I liked what you said. You, it's a, uh, doubting is a sign that you have a faith. That yeah. quote, you can't wrestle with something that's not there. Um, people, atheists sometimes, they're wrestling with God all the time. <laughs> but you can't wrestle with something that's not there. And the struggle is, is real. And um, you do get, get stronger in the wrestling. And I've just resigned myself to, I want to keep pressing in and talking to people like yourself and often people many years my senior just to see what they've discovered to be true of mm -hmm. God in their journey and, uh, and then focus on what I know to be true of, of the way God has revealed himself to me in the past. You mentioned an experience. Um, that was one of the questions. Is it wrong to ask God for a sign or ask God for an experience um, because... Is that, is that just not showing faith? I mean, there's, there's two sides. To it. I would say, like, if we're, if we're in the sense of, like, show me a sign, prove yourself, like, there is that, that Jesus has this uh, experience in the Gospels where he says it's a wicked generation that asks for a sign. So there's mm -hmm. one half where I say the yes and the no of this. So mm -hmm. the, like, yeah, maybe don't go in with that. On the, on the other hand, though, I think when we have experiences with God, it's always grace. Mm -hmm. It's always grace. It is the grace and mercy of God. And so, uh, yeah, go into that season of like, God, I'm open-handed. Show me what you will. But I, I would caution a sort of, I'm going to put myself as the sole arbiter of truth, and God, you have to fit into whatever category I tell you to fit mm -hmm. into. That might be an unhealthy place. Let him be yeah. God. Pastor Paul, will you close us with a blessing? I'd love to. Thank would you, you please stand? In ancient times, <laughs> uh, 
And in ancient places, those that wanted to receive a blessing held out their hands like this. And those that wanted to give a blessing held out their hands like this. Send you out with this Franciscan blessing. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers and half-truths and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world, so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. All God's people said. Amen. Amen. We'll see you guys next week. You're the first, you're the alpha, maker of the earth. By your word, by your word, you created life out of the dirt. Because you hold the world inside of your hands, you can move mountains at your command. You hold the world inside of your hands, you can move mountains at your command. God of glory, you are wonderful, wonderful. Christ the